Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us today for our uh, webinar with Roxanne Arnall and I. Uh, what buyers want building a, a business or a practice you can sell. Uh, we got about 60 people on the line right now. Uh, we had over 140 registers, so we're just going to give it a couple minutes uh, to let uh, people get in, figure out their tech, et cetera, um, and then we'll get going. So uh, appreciate your patience and uh, we'll get going here right away. Thank you. All right, I think we'll get going here. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for uh, taking time out of your day. I'm not sure what everybody's got going on um, in their practices with the uh, with the lockdown and everything. I imagine some of you are still seeing patients on an emergency basis. Uh, but without further ado, I think we'll just get right into it. So I'd like to, I, I'm Clayton Aiken. I'm a founder and the managing partner at Aiken Henderson CPAs in Calgary, Alberta. Um, I want to thank uh, Roxanne for allowing us to host this webinar um, and maybe change the narrative a little bit and talk about something other than uh, sort of what we've been talking about for the last uh, four or five weeks. Um, Roxanne is uh, an optometrist and um, sorry, uh, has, has been doing this for a, a long time and uh, I'll turn it over to you Roxanne, but just as a, uh, as a brief introduction, um, she sort of shifted focus from uh, actively practicing to, uh, to to getting into financial planning for optometrists, and so she's got a huge wealth of knowledge and an excellent background to be uh, to be helping us out to understand this stuff. So, great, thanks, thanks, Clayton, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us. Um, I'm really enjoying the partnership that we've developed. So. Me too. Um, and super excited on um, the number of people who are really ready to start talking about, you know, moving forward. I think it's it's time we start, you know, putting a more optimistic hat on. Um, this can certainly drag on a little bit longer than most of us want, but I think it's also an opportunity for us to spend some time preparing our practices for for the future. So we might as well take advantage of this time because it's pretty rare um, that this kind of opportunity is ever going to present itself again. So just a little bit brief about me. Um, Clayton did mention I, I was a practicing optometrist. I sold my practice in 2012 and really decided I, I wanted to still help people, but in a much deeper, more personal way. And uh, that's what led me to financial planning and and this is where I'm, I'm really working now to, to help people create great harm harmony. And I know Clayton, often you refer to yourself as a tax ninja. So <laughs> I'm always curious if you're the tax ninja, I don't know what I am, the tax, I don't know, Wonder Woman, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> really the big thing when we 
talk about selling a practice, it really is a culmination of your life's work financially. Um, chances are you've avoided taking salary a number of times because you were building your practice. So even just by a very conservative, conservative example, I've built this chart showing that if you started your practice cold at age 30, you gave up $25,000 of income in that first year, you had practice growth of 3% a year, um, and you gave up that same proportion of, of income moving forward, over a 30 year period of time, you will have amassed, if you were able to invest it on your own at 5% annual compound rate of return, you would have amassed just under $2.4 million alone. So if we think about what we've poured into and given up in our lives to build our practices, we really know that these practices are a huge, huge part of our retirement planning, right? So um, how much of your salary have you given up to build your business? How much could those dollars have purchased an investable asset? How much could you have compounded that over 30 years of your career? So it's a huge portion of your estate, but let's not also forget how much do you want to contribute to CRA? So I think it's super important that um, you want to maximize what you take home when you do dispense of your practice. So how are we going to do that? And, and Clayton's going to now cover one of those great ways um, for us to maximize that. And then we're going to talk a bit more about tax. Awesome. Um, yeah, so there's me. So uh, my background, uh, just as a brief introduction, is in uh, in tax and tax planning. Um, and we've recently, you know, in the last two years, gotten into um, running back end offices, uh, really from an accounting standpoint for um, a variety of firms and uh, including optometrists, which we've we've gotten pretty good at. Um, over the years of working with a, a few of our key clients. Um, so Roxanne mentions taxes and, and how to really pay less of them. Um, do you want to flip the slide there, Roxanne? Um, the, my there next slide is that federal subsidies. One. Oh yeah, okay, well let's let's get into that. And so um, what did you have to, you know, I'll, 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 I'll pop in off uh, uh, with whatever you wanted to say on that, Roxanne. Well, really the big one, um, just a note on the, the loan program, the SEBA, um, they've lowered the minimum on that, that T4 requirement to having paid $20,000 from the original 50. So that did open up the program to more, more offices. But keep in mind, if you can make that repayment by December 31st, 2022, Free you money. automatically save, yeah, 25%. So I think at the, the very minimum, even if you don't technically need the money per se, there's certainly an argument to be made that you should still apply for it. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you completely on that one. The interesting thing about the CEBA, there are a variety of programs, and I've talked quite a lot about this over the last three weeks um, and have sort of slowed down because I had to put my head down here and get some work done, but um, it's been very confusing. And so, you know, a, th a few things to point out on on the, the business loan. One, there is no requirement uh, for you to have a drop in your revenues um, like there is with the Com Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy. Um, two, there is a requirement for you to have paid out salaries in 2019 in order to be eligible for the, for the CEBA. Um, and so if you are, um, say, a sole practitioner, with a very small shop and, and you're the only one that works in it and you pay yourself dividends, you're not going to be eligible for this loan. There needs to have been some salary paid. Now, if you're um, like a good number of, uh, of our clients who have had to basically shutter their doors um, with the exception of some emergencies, um, there's some wages to make up there. And so the wage subsidy is definitely available to you. I think in most cases, it's going to be pretty easy to prove a 15% drop in sales in March and a 30% drop in sales in uh, April and May. And the wage subsidy, as it turns out, the applications for it opened up on the 27th. So four days ago now, you can go and access the wage subsidy through um, your My Business account. And um, it allows you to uh, recall employees retroactive to March 15th. Now there's an inner working there between if they've received amounts under the CERB, they may have to repay those. 
um, for some overlapping weeks. But it, what it really does is allow you, so you to maintain your relationships um, with your staff and get them paid in a lot of cases more than they would be able to access on the uh, CERB and they're going to like that. And so um, the challenge with this program is it's still the money's still not coming through quite yet. And so in order to recall those folks and retroactively pay them or maybe you've been paying them, you know, that requires some sort of bridge financing, which you're going to have to come up with out of your own pocket um, or the business's pocket in the meantime until the, the government reimbursements come through. So. Yeah, yeah, and keeping your staff happy, that's part of part of discussing even that business transition piece, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right, they're part of your asset that you've built. So we invest in them and um, and really we need to treat them that way. They're valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So at this point, Clayton, if you want to load your slide deck, do you need me to stop sharing my screen to do that? Um, sure, I, I, I mean, I, I thought we would go through yours, uh, Roxanne, and I would pop in at the end. Um, you know, did you want to? Yeah. yeah, did you want to keep going on yours? I think that's. We most yeah. certainly can. Okay. So we wanted to talk about two basic ways to sell your practice, because, like I said, it is a vital component of your wealth. So essentially, we can do a share sale or an asset sale. So in a share sale, we do have the possibility of using the lifetime capital gains exemption, which is a huge tax bonus there. So we want to try and maximize that if at all possible. Also keep in mind though that the buyer will then assume all the risk of the past company indiscretions. And there is likely a need for you to set up a hold co for certain asset transfer prior to a sale. So when we're selling those shares of that practice, there's going to be some assets you're going to want to maintain and we'll we'll cover what some of those are shortly. But yeah. Keeping yes. them in the business is is part of that tax strategy. So yeah, totally agree. I mean, you know, if you look at um, the rich get richer, and I was watching a, a documentary on this the other day, and effectively, you know, wealthy individuals uh, take advantage of capital tax rates, which by and large the world over um, are much lower than income tax rates. And so, when we're looking at income disparities, you know, if you want to if you want to sort of multiply your wealth, the way to do that is by paying capital tax. And so without a capital gains exemption, you know, you're only paying half. But what the capital gains exemption does is it allows you to sell your shares and not pay any tax up to a certain maximum. And there's planning that we can undertake that we can still undertake despite the uh, changes that, that were announced in 2017 that allow, you know, potentially depending on what your, your college, your individual provincial rules are for company ownership, we, we can even build it in so that your family members can tap into some gains exemptions as well with with you know certain certain rules and as as roxanne says um you know the, there's liabilities that come with shares so a buyer will often want to buy assets and a seller will, will often want to sell shares so it's really finding that equilibrium um and it, it, when we talk about when you buy shares as a buyer and they're coming as a bundle of assets and liabilities you know, there are ways through contractual um, warranties, et cetera, to um, have recourse if something pops up as a liability that wasn't expected. But in order to enforce that contract, you know, you still need to be able to find the purchaser and enforce a contract on the purchaser, which can be problematic at times. So that's just sort of things to think about in a share sale. Um, certainly when a buyer uh, engages us to look at um, shares in a share sale, we'll go through due diligence. So we'll look through you know, we'll have a lawyer look through the minute books of the company. We'll have, we'll look through previous tax returns and the accounting of the company to see if we can um, sort of dig out any unexpected liabilities that uh, might not be reported in the sale document. So anyway, sorry, that's my little add on to the share sale portion, Roxanne. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And um, I don't think that due diligence gets enough uh, credibility, really. And uh, it's super important, right? So yeah, yeah. And I mean, we talk about past company indiscretions. We're not so much talking about things that are going to be covered by your professional liability insurance. It's really about, you know, tax, tax audits, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, absolutely. Generally speaking, your professional liability insurance is going to have to run for a period after a sale, um, you know, after the sale anyways. And so that's certainly the way it is with a CE, CPA purchase of a practice. So 
um, you know, you, you'd keep that going for a few years just in case, right? So. Yeah, I know in my case, um, what the professional liability insurer did is they just moved me to a retired status. So essentially my plan continues on indefinitely at no charge. There you it's go. A great program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so when we talk about an asset sale, which is what buyers usually want, um, you know, you're not able to take advantage of the lifetime capital gains exemption because you're not selling shares. And there can be, so now you've still got a company, you're just selling out the assets from under the company, and then you have to take whatever's left and, and deal with the liability or the, yeah, the liabilities of the company. Um, and when you know if you if you've got a if you've got a client list for example that you've uh, accumulated over the years and it started at zero dollars when you when you started your practice and now you're selling it for half a million dollars you know you've potentially got a half a million dollar capital gain there on the value of the quote unquote goodwill that you established in that client list and so in an asset sale it actually gets pretty complicated because we have to go through and say what we're selling in an order um, and, and what value we're assigning to each of those. So if you've got um, some, some of your equipment that is part of that sale, maybe you've got uh, a building that is part of that sale and there's a goodwill portion, it becomes an accounting and a tax exercise to go through and assign yes. values to each of those so that you can figure out how to calculate the tax impacts in the company that you're keeping for selling the assets out from under it. The, 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 buyer, pref, the buyer prefers that because basically if they're buying a, a list of goodwill for say $500,000, they're going to get $500,000 in what we call tax basis that they can depreciate over a number of years. Now the depreciation rate on, a, on goodwill is pretty low, uh, but it is there. And whereas if they're selling shares, the buyer will not be able to realize what they've put in the money that they've put into those shares until they actually go and sell those shares or execute a tax transaction to otherwise take advantage of that what we call cost basis so you know broadly speaking you know we can tax tax person this to death but broadly speaking sellers want to sell shares as uh, buyers want to buy assets and so it really is finding that equilibrium um for between the two to arrive at a final deal and getting comfort on a share sale that you're not picking up some liabilities that that you know you can't live with um for example when you carry on the practice yeah, yeah. absolutely and just one other comment on the asset yeah. sell side is um because of provincial regulations on that professional corp designation you will end up having to roll that professional corp into a hold co um Simple, not overly expensive. You're not setting up a whole new company. You're just doing a rollover, but that'll also allow you to keep some of those assets that you're wanting to keep in much the same way we talked about them on the share sales side, where you're going to create a hold co and then move them into that hold co. Yep, agreed. Um, there's just some additional considerations, really, that just to keep in mind, right? So. On a share purchase, certainly for the buyer, um, it does give you an ease of practice continuation. Um, as far as life goes on, you just keep going, right? There's there's nothing that has to happen different on, on the day you've taken over. You just continue on. Um, and, and you do maintain some liability though, to keep in mind of any severance generated from past employment for employees. So, when we talk about the benefit on the asset purchase side there, essentially all staff are are fired when the previous owner closes up his business. And now you're having to look at rehiring all those staff again. And, and there is certainly a risk that you could lose some good staff in that process. It's change. We know people aren't crazy about change. This is a prime example. It stresses people out. Um, and and you may need to offer some some increased incentives to get some of those real key people back. Um, you have eliminated that that severance portion. Did you want to talk on that at yeah. all? Yeah, I mean, you know, an interesting real life scenario here that we've actually gone through at our firm because we've been doing a lot of work um, around the wage subsidy and the um, the business account, the CEBA. And, uh, you know, we, we recently worked with a business owner who acquired the business in a new company. So that was, so it was an asset purchase um, in November. The business didn't change. It was a restaurant. 
and the staff stayed the same. There was no blip in the radar whatsoever. They did a pretty smooth transition on their payroll accounts, but it was a new company. They were they were terminated from the old company and hired from the new company. Operations didn't cease, same business, but now we fast forward to today with the CEBA announcement. Um, and you know, previously it was $50,000. I think they qualify now that they've dropped it to 20, but they, the new company hadn't paid wages of $50,000, right? So it's just a real life interesting example of what we're seeing for that exact scenario right now. I mean, it's not every year that we enter a global pandemic and the government starts uh, having to hand out money due to forced shutdowns. But um, that's a real life example of where, yeah, you're terminated and rehired and there can be some consequences to do with that that, that you might not expect, right? So, yeah. yeah. Thanks for mentioning that because certainly anytime we're using a revenue test for anything in that transition period, you know, you can certainly lose out on some opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, we, again, another another company that we are dealing with, a professional services firm on the revenue test drop, they've just acquired another bundle of assets in January. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a problem, um, you know, so they, they, they did not qualify, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we did talk a little bit about what that lifetime capital gains exemption could look like. And I mean, it started, you'll have to forgive me, I don't remember what year, but um, it does increase up every year with the government's inflation level. So for 2020, it's sitting at 883,000. Um, so any gain you make above the, your cost of starting that business, up to that amount is completely tax free as long as we qualify for it. Um, so there's always an asterisk to everything and that's where really planning ahead can become vitally important. Absolutely. The other, yeah. yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is if you've already used some of your lifetime capital gains exemption, you do get a little bit more room every year. So if you, you know, sold a previous business that you had a practice in a different different city, you sold that one, you've moved to a new practice, chances are you have some additional capital gains exemption room again that you could tap into. Yeah, agreed. So, you know, one of the main points to consider here is, you know, you need to have a corp to have a gains exemption. Um, if you're a proprietorship and you're not incorporated, you're never going to get this. Um, so that is one of the benefits of incorporating. There are some nice exit strategy planning, tax uh, planning, uh, scenarios that we can run within a corp that we can't do in a proprietorship. And again, you know, for a company whose family, maybe maybe the shares are owned by um, spouse um, and, you know, in certain cases across the country, I think you can do family trusts as well. That allows you the opportunity to multiply that capital gains exemption. So, you know, pretty quickly a, a $4 million sale might be able to happen without tax. So. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's truly amazing from an estate planning standpoint. But you bring up another good point when you say, you know, this certainly doesn't qualify for sole proprietorships. And now when I'm advising a lot of my new doctors, there really isn't a great hard rule to convince them to incorporate right now because of those tax changes that happened in 2017. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that could be a whole course on itself when to incorporate. Uh, my my general advice is to look to two things. One, what are the liabilities of your of your operations and your business, and can they be mitigated um, somewhat by incorporation? Um, you know, I'm not sure that's particularly relevant. Well, I'm sorry, I know that's not relevant whatsoever yeah. in a professional corporation standpoint because your liability sees right through that corp. And exactly. so then the second point really is, are you able to tuck enough away after you've spent what you need to survive, um, are you able to tuck a bit away? And now how much is that? And what are some other tricks that we can do with that money within the rules of the tax system, such as life insurance and, and gains exemption planning, et cetera? Um, what, are, what are some of the tricks that we can um, deploy to, to help that wealth grow faster than it otherwise would? And so really it's, are you making more than you need? Okay, maybe now it's time to consider incorporating. Yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, yeah. when we talk about strategies, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Clayton, but we can't set up an independent pension plan inside a proprietorship that has to be corporate, correct? Yeah, not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah, 
right? So there are some additional strategies around that. I think for a number of new grads, particularly if they're still in the associate standpoint, it's pretty tough to make a big argument for setting up that PC yet. Yeah, I agree. You can always go there later. You know, the thing, the thing with tax planning is, unless you're talking about a sale, you need some lead time for a sale, but um, you know, you can always you can always make your structure more extravagant down the road. Often it's more expensive to do it later than it is to do it now, but by the time you factor in the professional fees in maintaining the extra structure between now and then, you know, maybe it balances out. So you got to do a bit of a juggling act yeah, on that. Yeah. yeah. Fair, fair. So aside from having to be a corporation to utilize that lifetime capital gains exemption, there are some very specific rules that CRA has in place. And all of these rules have to be met in order to qualify to use that lifetime capital gains exemption. So this is where some of that additional pre-planning time becomes super important. So um, you need to obviously be a small business corp. I, I don't think any, certainly any independent private optometry practice is bigger than a small business corp. Yeah. <laughs> what's that, what's the uh, cutoff on income? Um, for a small business corporation, um, you know, the, the main the main rules are that all or most of the value of your assets need to be deployed in active business. And right. so it's, uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, just think private company, most of you will qualify. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and that leads us into point number two, where throughout the entire 24 months, immediately to the shared disposition, you have to have had at least 50% of the fair market value of the assets used in active business. And today, when we're talking about very a, a significant drop in active business income, shall we say, for some people, if you've already got a substantial investment portfolio inside your corporation, um, you certainly run the risk of being offside on this one. I see it a lot with professional corporations. You know, that first slide that you brought up had us amassing what, $2.5 million in wealth. And if that's sitting inside um, a corporation in a real estate investment that you're also practicing in, uh, maybe you own your building in the building next door, or maybe you own the building and you're, you know, the, you're a small lease in it, um, or maybe you've got a large investment in a stock portfolio, you can come, you can run offside with these rules pretty quickly. So if you're contemplating a sale, it's really important to start taking a look at your balance sheet a couple of years before the sale um, to make sure that your balance sheet is clean for the purposes of the multi uh, multiplying or accessing the lifetime capital gains exemption. And 50%, it needs to be maintained. And that's fair value. So, um, you know, where you can run offside on that too is, hey, I've got this little building that I paid, you know, $500,000 for 15 years ago. Now it's worth two million, but on the balance sheet, it's only half a million. We're looking at the two million, but we're also looking at the value of your practice as a whole, which will be a hundred bucks on your balance sheet of, or on your statement of equity effectively, which will be your initial investment in it. So everything gets brought up to fair market value for these calculations. Yeah, so you know that's why rushing into um, what we call a fire sale isn't isn't always ideal because people don't necessarily have the time to make sure that they're on side with this. Absolutely. And and we see it all the time where it's like, what can we do for retroactive planning on this one? Unfortunately, um, nothing. Um, and in fact, you know, even I guess using the word retroactive planning is probably dangerous, but um, there's not a lot of cleanup that you can do after the fact on this one. So you got to make sure that you're on side with it. Yeah. And then really the last of the big three points um, for conditions to meet to qualify for that lifetime capital gains exemption is is who has owned those shares. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for the whole 24 months, you need to have held the shares or someone related to you. Um, you know, we've we've done we've there are ways um, we've done a, a, a freeze a couple of years back and it ended up uh, resulting very quickly in a sale and we weren't expecting that. Um, but the way that the the way that the reorganization of capital was undertaken was such that um, it didn't put the this this part in jeopardy we, we you know that even though new family members received shares of the company at the moment in time and then shortly thereafter sold the way that the structure was undertaken or the reorg was undertaken um you know basically family members 
or the original owner had owned those shares for 24 months prior. So it's really important that you look at if you're doing reorganizations of capital or any kind of moves within to separate out assets in your corporate structure that you have a, a good tax person look at this beforehand to make sure you're not going to run afoul of these rules. Yeah. So in my situation, I actually formed a partnership three years before I sold my remaining shares. But um, if my partner had chosen to sell her shares in under 24 months, she would have given up the opportunity to utilize the lifetime capital gains exemption, correct? Um, so I'd have to look at how your sale was structured. Um, partnership units generally aren't eligible for the lifetime capital gains exemption, but if you're saying, if you're using the term partner as in she was a shareholder and you got shareholders in the same company, then you're, yes. yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 No, I do think we all, we, I catch myself on that term, you know, a fair bit of times because we tend to use partner as in somebody we're connected with. Yeah, not you're a partner. Not the legal yeah. term of partnership. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I did talk a little bit about there being some assets you're going to want to keep, whether you Sorry, do a share let's sale. Sit tight there for one sec, Roxanne. Oh, the last, no the last part with the lifetime capital gains exemption, one rule that is critical is at the moment of sale, 90% of your assets have to be deployed in active business. And so it's 50% for the last two years, it's 90% at the moment of sale. And oh. so, you know, so there's that there's that other rule in there as well. So it's it's really cautious planning. 90% can be a bit tougher to go to when you're when you're when your professional corporation is stacked with passive assets that you've accumulated over the years. And so there needs to be a transaction that takes place if you're in that scenario to make sure that what we, your shares are what we would call purified before the sale. So so now that so you've purified your small business corporation, you're ready for your share sale and your buyers hot and hot to go on your practice um you know you can sell them shares and access your gains exemption so yeah, yeah. sorry i'm not i must have deleted that when i separated the slides out because you're no right worries. it's no kind worries. of critical <laughs> <laughs> no worries the good news is is we wouldn't let that uh, slip through for any of our clients certainly if we were doing your tax work on a sale so no <laughs> <laughs> So when we talk about purification too, Clayton, one of those ways is we can pull out those assets, right, ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, keeping in mind that often there will be tax consequences to moving assets out, but often it can be done on a tax deferred basis where, you know, we can undertake transactions to move assets out of one company and into a sister company that is not the target of a sale, so. Right. So one of those assets that we're going to want to keep is if you've developed any whole life or universal life insurance policies that have been owned by that corporation, particularly if they're on you. Um, you could always obviously sell them with the business, but if you added to that investment portfolio inside of them, because that is one of our tax strategies, chances are you're going to want to take that with you. And I always tend to be a little bit we're quasi query um, on that whole idea of giving somebody else a life insurance policy where where they essentially benefit from you dying. I, I kind of don't like that idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so when you set your life insurance policy up, you know, it's real important to consider what the what the horizon of your operating company are and whether or not you actually bake that life insurance policy into the same company, et cetera. So that's, you know, that's just things to consider because certainly moving life insurance policies around after the fact in and out of companies can be very expensive. Yeah, if you're doing that asset sale, there is no trigger on that because you're just, you're maintaining that corporation and it just gets renamed to a hold code. So there is actually no movement. That's right. So, but yes, there can certainly be tax tax implications in moving life insurance policy. So that is always something worth having that discussion ahead of time. Obviously, other assets to keep would be corporate investment accounts. Um, again, chances are you use that to help build up some of your estate. So you're probably not likely going to sell that with the business. <laughs> and lastly, the assets to keep are are any personal items of value to you? So I do know some people have, you know, a bit of an antiques collection um, in the eye care industry, equipment, glasses that they may want to, they may want to keep as opposed to sell with the business, depending how attached you are to that stuff. 
Um, and in my case, I actually had art owned by my corporation that I chose to keep. So I'm I'm kind of the art junkie. That's my that's my little Achilles heel, I guess. Um, and partnerships. Again, not using the legal term for partnerships, but what if I'm only selling part of my business? So I'm selling 40% of my shares, for example. Um, do you want to talk about any differences that that might create? Yeah, I mean, it's really important when you're, uh, you know, and, and this is particularly when you go to sell your business, a buyer is going to want to see this, um, particularly when they're buying a fractional share um, or not a fractional share, but a fraction of the shares of a corporation. Um, you're likely going to have a unanimous shareholders agreement in place. And what are the terms of that unanimous shareholders agreement? Because when a when a buyer comes into, so anytime you're in, in I guess, quote unquote partnership, not the legal term, but, you know, in a part, share, sharing share ownership with a, with a corporate owner, um, you're going to have a unanimous shareholders agreement in place, or you ought to. If you don't, um, it's probably wise to disconnect from this webinar now call your lawyer and go get a USA in place uh, because that that is priority number one. Um, yeah. USAs will address a lot of things from what happens when I want to exit the building do, or the building, the, the business. Do I need life insurance um, to satisfy a buy sell agreement? Because when I die, I don't want to be, I don't want you to have to be in business or I don't want my wife to have to be in business with you operating this business um, or my spouse or my husband or whatever. Um, and so a USA will deal with that. And so one thing to think about on this is when a buyer's coming into buying shares of your company, they're also buying into that unanimous shareholders agreement. And that's something that they're going to want to review as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's super important. And I think sometimes, yes, we need the lawyer to draw that up, but before we put pen to paper, it is super worthwhile to have your financial planner as myself and Clayton, your accountant, to review that because there are a few things in it I've seen over the years that just kind of for some reason got slipped through the cracks, right? So how we calculate yeah. the fair market value of that business in the event of a disability or in the event of premature death. Um, if it's not worded correctly, you could have a huge deposit to the capital dividend account that now becomes part of the fair market value and that was never the intent. Yeah, you might be giving a lot of benefits away to somebody who you never intended to give benefits away to. I agree, a USA needs to be nice and tight and buttoned up. And frankly, as the business evolves, it should probably be addressed. It's somewhat like a will in that way. As your life circumstances change, you know, your will should be revisited and updated. But so too, you know, you might want to think about updating your USA. If you're in a partnership, a legal partnership, um, you know, that would be a USA in a partnership context would be called a partnership agreement. It's it's very similar idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, really, the rest of my slides, Clayton, are are perfect for wrap up before we hit the question period. So fabulous. I guess well, I we never know. really mentioned that. Um, so I'm yeah. going to make an announcement over here in the uh, questions. So here I go. An error has occurred. Live Q and A. Um, meeting notes. Can you get into Q&A, Roxanne? For whatever reason, I cannot get into Q&A. If there's any questions. Um, yeah, I have an error has occurred too. Sorry. Okay, so, so let's assume that our Q&A isn't going to work. Feel free to bombard me with emails with your questions um, and I will hit them out of my email. Clayton at AkinHenderson.ca. Um, and as your questions come up, we will uh, try and get to them all. Um, and so I guess, yeah, at this point, we'll we'll turn it over to me. So here we go. Screen two. So you should have up on your screen, Roxanne, confirm, please. The accountant's playbook, accounting or uh, optometrist uh, cloud accounting solutions. Do you see that? I do not. Okay, here it comes. And there we go. There we go. I do. I All think right. We got it. So, <laughs> you know, aside from being structured correctly from a tax perspective, I mean, that is a huge, huge part of it. And making sure that when, you know, your, your exit is imminent. I mean, like, let's just be honest here. Your exit is imminent. And so how do you want to go out, right? Do you want to go out with a nice pool of passive assets and a good financial plan? that Roxanne's put together for you? 
um, accessing your lifetime capital gains exemption and having a nice clean share sale um, and having done all the things all along the way to ensure that that happens so that you can save, you know, a single lifetime capital gains exemption will save you north of $200,000 in tax um, when it comes time to sell. And that's only for one owner. Imagine if there's four owners, right? So it's a huge deal. So that's, now that you've got world that, cruise. Sorry, say that again. That two hundred thousand dollars. That's my world cruise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's my uh, that's my cabin on the beach in Mexico or whatever. So yeah, um, you know that that's a lot of rent. Uh, so so now that you've got that up. set up, really, it's it's setting up your business operationally um, for a sale. And so how do you do that? So I put together some slides about you know, how do we automate um, an optometrist back end so that they don't have to worry about their accounting? Their accounting's always tight. Um, and so if you think franchise model, what does a buyer want to come into? I'd argue that tomorrow's buyer wants to walk into a pre-established set of processes, accounting controls. They, they don't want to walk into a paper mess that they have to figure out and learn how to do business. If they could, if there's another practice for sale, where they've got the option to walking into a nice set of processes that are functional um, and there's not going to be a whole huge learning curve to get their handle around that part. That's probably what they're interested in um, so that they can practice service clients, do marketing, etc. Right. So um, I'll share with you the uh, the playbook here. So this is the first time that I've, I've given this out uh, in a webinar, but it is basically how we automate um, uh, an optometrist back at, back office. Um, so there's our disclaimer. So the first, I'm going to show you some software in this. I, I just want to be clear. I don't sell software. I'm not a, I mean, we do resell software, but we don't have any preferences on vendors or anything. There's tons of options out there and we'll get into that, um, as we go through, but, um, you know, we're sort of software agnostic. So this isn't about bookkeeping. Um, this is about sound accounting controls and understanding your business at a deep financial level that a lot of you might not have access to right now. So, you know, I go through my example of a couple of key clients who have really benefited from this and who are they? You know, we've got client A who has a rocking practice, loves data. Um, they feel like they know how to use the numbers if they could just get a handle on what the numbers are um, in terms, and, and we'll get into what kind of numbers can be very beneficial for you. Um, they know that there's room to grow the business, but they don't know what they need to get out of their system in order to make the decisions to help them grow. You know, then there's then there's uh, practice owner B who wants a little more freedom with their lives, spend more time at home with their kids, worry less about the bookkeeping and the tax man, and, uh, you know, and make sure that their employees are paid on time and just just really want to step away from the administrating of the business and focus more on practicing in the business and growing the business, you know? And so, and then there's, you know, there, there's this other sort of entrepreneur who, entrepreneurs notoriously wear a lot of hats. And so, you know, we see this a lot where there's an entrepreneur who just has to do it all. They got to do everything in their business. They're the, they're the only person that can do everything in their business. Um, and so, you know, here they are managing the bookkeeping, the payroll, doing T4s, running the practice, doing the scheduling, really leading to this high degree of micromanagement, which eventually leads to burnout. These people fail CRA audits unless they um, basically take their evenings and weekends to, to manage those audits. And so, you know, this is looking at outsourcing some of these core functions that are not really practice related and they're, they're more administration related that, you know, this is a prime target for that type of an entrepreneur. So data entry is fun um, and a great use of my time, said no one ever. I mean, if you're, if you're, it, you know, raise your hand on what the most valuable resource in anybody's practice is. Um, number one, you know, some business owners may just go straight to, you know, it's me, I'm the doctor. Uh, but, you know, second or first, depending on how you look at it, it should be your people, right? And And looking after your people, looking after your customers and growing that list. And so, all of those things that we just said, accounting has nothing to do with that. Um, really understanding the results of the accounting has something to do with it, uh, but actually being involved in the compiling of the data entry and killing yourself on day-to-day -day administrative tasks 
that's not a good use of your time. And certainly today with, you know, all the technology we have, we're really silly not to utilize it. Bang on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, what's the characteristics of old school bookkeeping? And so I'm sorry, there's probably going to be a few people on the line here who this really resonates with, maybe not in a good way, good way but, um, you know, first it's manual, it's draining. You wouldn't believe the number of business owners who I talk to when we first start talking who go, oh, no, it doesn't take me that much time at all. And when you actually start adding up the amount of time and energy that's going into the accounting, um, it's staggering, but it really takes a bit of honesty to get to those numbers. Um, it distracts the best resources in your practice, which we've already established to be human resources, your humans, um, away from revenue producing value, value creation activities. Like the, the people who work in your practice are the perfect people to help you grow that practice and it not through administering paperwork. Old school bookkeeping is reactive late and when it's reactive and late, it has diminished value. I can't tell you how many business owners that we sit down with six months after the year, year end to review their financial statements. Um, you know, we're reviewing things that happened at least six months ago, at worst, um, you know, 18 months ago. And so, you know, what value is that when it's when it's that far behind? Um, there's no clarity, no process on the bookkeeping. Um, there's no controls. Uh, it, it just sort of ends up in a shoebox and we'll figure it out later to facilitate a tax filing. And there's a lack of real time information about your practice, which probably goes back to the diminished value thing. Wouldn't it be nice if you knew what was going on in your practice in real time, all the time at a really granular visual um, way? And so I, go ahead. I just so. interject there. I think the reality is most optometrists aren't aren't trained to be business owners. I, I think back to the business class we had in, in university and, and it never taught us how to manage those numbers. Sure, we were taught what it looked like to open some financial statements, but we didn't understand how we could utilize them. And I think, and certainly in my case, I had a number of different accountants over my optometric practice career i um, really looking for the perfect fit because I didn't have somebody who actually was able to tell me the value in them. They were really just a tax exercise. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, a great book on that is called E-Myth, um, where, you know, it gives the story of a pie maker whose grandmother's pie recipe was awesome. And so they decided to, you know, that 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 person is a technician, a pie technician, and they decided to go into business for themselves because they're great at making pies. And what they quickly realized was that um, the business of making pies is quite a lot different than making grandma's pies and having your family love them, et cetera. So uh, very, very relevant. And really, when you're looking at, you know, when you're looking at um, um, accounting control systems and information about your business, actually setting up to get that information it can be very time consuming so what do the best optometrist practice optometric practices that fetch the highest sale price have in common like there's a few common threads right and so um so you know great client list great location brand equity definitely but what else right they've got great accounting and business systems and processes they are turnkey, think franchise. Buyers want easy. These owners know every facet of their numbers inside and out. They know what their business is worth um, so well that they can talk a buyer into paying that price, right? Because they can explain their numbers seven ways from Sunday. If you can't see it, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, you can't lead it. You always have to start with sort of why are you in this business and what is the end game exit strategy and how do you set yourself up right at the beginning um, to get that. Um, I'm gonna skip past, I don't know if Scott's audio will come through here. Um, I think we'll skip past that one, but basically Scott, who is um, a, a business coach on our team, um, is talking here about how most most business owners, to, to Roxanne's point, know nothing about their financial statements. It's just numbers to facilitate a tax filing, right? And so the power in those financial statements is immense. And so what is the barrier to good accounting and good, you know, business practice, you know, good business processes and good business practices 
First one is time. I mean, this stuff takes time to set up. If you're going to go and teach yourself how to run a business, how to be a doctor, and how to do your own accounting, uh, that's a daunting. That's a daunting sort of undertaking. You know, entrepreneurs wear a lot of hats, and so you got to decide and pick and choose really which ones you're going to wear. Resources. You know, it's only recently that technology has come along to offer small businesses and and even in in some cases medium sized businesses the ability to have access to fabulous financial information about their business in real time, work you know, a quarter as hard as they used to to get at that information, used to have to be a big company and hire a finance department to get at that information. Now, little businesses can do that. They just basically need to outsource their accounting function to an expert in the field and boom, you've got it. Or you know, commit the time to learning the systems and set it up themselves. Uh, but you can actually, using technology, get to having a a big uh, a big team, a big finance team, a lot easier than you used to be. Uh, the next thing that is a barrier is value and capital. A lot of business owners don't see the value in paying an accountant, you know, a few hundred bucks a month for bookkeeping, um, or to develop good accounting controls for them and to monitor those accounting controls and paying their staff when the controls are coming off the rails. A lot of people don't see the value in that. And what I say when, what I mean when I say they don't see the value in that is they think that it's better for them to just undertake this stuff themselves and because they value their time less than they value the few hundred bucks a month that it costs to get this stuff done externally. So let's, let's take a moment on that one. So sure. when I think about the new buyers of today and people talk about millennials and the reality is in today's new group of optometrists, they're really looking for much more work-life balance than I think people of my generation and older really looked at. And I was part of that change as we started to see more women come into the, the industry and there was a lot of talk, well, women don't work as hard as men, so that's a problem. We're going to need more people. And I really don't think it's a gender issue. I think it's more a reality that there's much more to life than just our practice. So if I'm going to spend 30 hours a week in my practice because I want more work-life balance, does that mean I want to spend 10 hours of my week managing my accounting systems? Um, there's a cost to that. If I'm going to spend that extra 10 hours, I'm probably going to make way more money spending it in the exam room. So let's yeah. be realistic about that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, not only are you spending your time in the exam room, but now it's come time to sell your business. And now you've not only got to train the buyer on, uh, you know, how to how to run your practice, but also how to do the accounting that you've been doing for 10 hours a week. I mean, it's daunting uh, for them. Right. And so when they if they're comparing your practice to a practice that has this stuff in place, pretty easy decision um, yeah. if, you know, if the values are similar and, and you'll fetch a higher value, frankly, because there's more value to it. And then the last piece is knowledge. Knowledge goes with time. You can get the knowledge. You just got to commit the time to do it. And so all of these things can be sort of subverted um, or skipped by by just getting some good technology in place, hiring uh, somebody to help you with some training, developing great processes, put the work in up front and have a great system that sort of drives itself. So what can be automated? I mean, this is pretty cool. We can automate for, from an accounting perspective, almost anything uh, from time entry to um, you know, practice management, to expenses, financial statement, re prep, AP, reporting, KPI. I mean, the future is all about integration. If we go back to this slide, you know, we've got hubs here and we'll talk about this in a second, but we've got a hub here and then all of these tie into the hub. And so it's really overseeing those integrations and making sure that they're functioning properly. That's the new accountants. That's the new accountants job. The, the, the old accountant does debits and credits. The new accountant is really a technology expert because um, the future is all about integration. So your hubs are your um, QBO and Zero are the main big players in the space in Canada right now. Certainly Sage has an online offering. I'm not as familiar with it. Um, we support QBO and Zero. Uh, if you look at what was in the app store for, for apps that fully integrate with this software, there was over 800 in the app stores alone 
for these two pieces of software. And QBO caught up in a hurry, by the way. Zero used to be a dominant market force here in terms of integrations. And that's just what's in their marketplaces. I mean, that's just in their app store. There are loads and loads of other external integrations um, that, that you can get at that just aren't listed in the app store. Here's Aiken Henderson's tech, tech stack. I mean, this is, this is some of the software that we use and most of it talks to it, each other, right? And so that can be a bit scary, you know, to look at and go, holy crap, do I need 39 pieces of tech? Probably not. Our average, our average accounting system for an optometrist is like four or five. And we'll get into that right now. So um, I've got, sorry, everybody who's in Ontario. Um, I've got ATB in here because they're an Alberta bank. But the first step in, in creating a beautiful accounting system is getting all the transactional data into us. And we do that by having these bank feeds come into your accounting system. So we see the transactions as they're happening. And so you go out on your BMO credit card and have lunch. lunch. We have that transaction within a few minutes. And, and then, you know, on, on, we'll talk about what happens on the other end, but we're seeing these transactions come in in real time. That gives us, as your finance team, a lot of power um, to make sure that things are booked quickly and accurately. Canada versus the US, I mean, this is a huge discussion. Um, the Canada, we have we have GST. Um, a lot of you have GST. Those who sell retail will have GST. Um, and uh, even so in the US, they don't have VAT taxes. And so accounting, automated accounting in the US is a lot easier because basically I need a bank statement and I can book transactions off a bank statement. And for, in a lot of cases, that's good enough audit evidence for the IRS. In Canada, not so much. We need a receipt attached to a transaction on a bank statement and that is your audit evidence here. So Canada has a lot more stringent requirements. Who's the winner so far in banking? I haven't looked at this in the last few months, uh, but CIBC is ahead in terms of integrations. The difference there is if you look at these banks, they're all feeding, uh, they're not feeding the software directly data. What is happening is the software, QBO and Zero, is logging into your bank accounts and taking basically a screenshot of your transactions and converting that to text and a usable transaction. Whereas CIBC and a lot of the banks in the US feed direct transactional data right into your bookkeeping system. CIBC opened that up, I believe, last summer. Um, and uh, I, I think it, it won't take long for the other banks to follow suit. So when we're setting up this, so now we've got your bank feeds, now what's important? Well, it's communication and understanding how we talk to each other and what the rules of engagement are. And so we've got a partner portal set up that we list out your playbook. When you go for lunch, here's what you need to do. When uh, you direct energy utility bill comes in, here's what you need to do. In a lot of cases, it's nothing. We'll try and, we'll try and uh, automate that. Um, and then when there's tasks for you to do, which we try and limit the tasks to two per month, um, you know, you'll get them through here. Calendar of events, you got a GST return due. Um, you've got a payroll remittance due. We'll set that up in your calendar of events. We can have discussions through here. Keep all your year end files, everything in one nice tidy place. So really doing a bookkeeping system through email um, is it's challenging, especially when there's any level of complexity, which is why we use uh, a branded portal. Um, where everybody can log into and, and see what's going on. So let's get into some cycles. Um, I got a question here. Um, that's a great question. I'm going to save that one till the end. Um, revenues, part one. So I, I have, I've heard of Revolution out east. Somebody's been using Revolution. I think it's an American piece of software. The main ones that I see uh, doctors using uh, for their practices in Alberta is Visualize and Optisys, and of course eClaim uh, Telus for for billing and and uh, and receivables from from insurance parties. Unfortunately, Visualize and Optisys do not integrate with QBO yet, and so the workaround that we've come to is to say, um, okay. Um, basically, all deposits get put, booked to a clearing account. Run your sales, run your AI through your visualizer, your Optisys, and at the month end, give us a report and we'll reconcile the deposits that went into your account to that report. And if there's a variance, we're going to have a talk. Um, and generally speaking, that's worked out really well. And so that's how we deal with revenues. We true it up at the month end. Um, and then the other nice thing too is out of visualize, you can run a report that says, okay, this is my um, prescription retail sales, my non-prescription retail sales, um, et cetera. 
and we'll break those revenues out in your financial reporting um, accordingly. So the actual um, revenue generation and uh, collection is handled usually still internally by staff. That's, a, that's something that can't be automated just yet. So as I said, yeah, deposits go straight into a clearing account at month end, we get the report and we, we reconcile it. So, the, so that's with revenues. Now, expenses and bills are a lot closer to full automation. We have tools where you say, okay, I just went out for lunch, obviously isn't happening lately, but uh, snap a picture of the receipt and it comes into our system. We see the accompanying transaction come in from your bank uh, account and we match them up and enter it in your accounting system. That's usually a lot of the time when we get to know your system that can be fully automated. Uh, but if not, you know, it takes usually takes, I think we promise a week to two week turnaround on those types of transactions, just depending. But as we get to know more and more, those transactions become automated. So uh, if you think of your I recommend bills or your associate bills, um, those you, you would submit those to the system, they'd get queued up as an accounts payable usually right away. Um, and that's happening in real time. So you can generally in one of our systems, you can run an AP listing and, and it's pretty up to date. Um, Roxanne, do you have anything to pop in there? Or shall I keep going? No, that's great. Um, do you have any idea from your current experience, if I have a staff person um, who's kind of managing the portal on, on my end, what kind of time commitment are they looking at? Yeah, so that that's a great question. Um, it really comes down to, it's a lot up front. Like we've got 30, 60 days of learning um, and that's really us learning your transactions and teaching, installing good controls that are customized for your accounting practice that again, a buyer is going to look at and go, wow, this is great. It works. I don't need to relearn a whole bunch of um, things here aside from being a doctor. And so um, the time commitment reduces dramatically. Our typical uh, process to include the staff person on your end, which we would call a business affairs manager, for example, they'd get two requests per month. One request would be, here's a whole bunch of bank transactions come through that we would typically need receipts for. We didn't get receipts for them. Please submit them, right? And the second one would be, we don't know what this transaction is. Can you please provide a description? So you can imagine in the first few months of dealing in one of these types of systems, you're going to be a lot more labor intensive, but then you're going to start submitting receipts on time, um, you know, all the time because you want to stop responding to those requests. And we're going to get to know your transactions as we go through, um, you know, because we've we've done some learning, right? So, um, but, you know, typically speaking, I've, I've heard that people have gone from sort of eight hours a week to an hour and a half a week, including running payroll, approving and running payroll. So, you know, that's that's a real life experience uh, from from one of the doctors that's on with us. Great. Um, OK, so now we've got your we've got your bill set up. How do you pay them? Well, you just we, we do another piece. Sorry, got to get back to this one. So, you know, you've got your AP queued up. You can go into another piece of software and just say, great, I want to pay some people now. Click, 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 pay. And so if you look at, um, I recommend, I'm, we're, we're trying to talk them into getting on with these. I don't think it's going to take very much. Um, and then associate banks, bank accounts, for example, once they're linked up, um, you, you literally just click the button and instead of the associate having to go deposit a check, uh, it, I'm assuming they're a contractor, by the way, and not on salary, um, they get an email notification saying, uh, you know, Dr. Arnell has paid you. Here's the invoice. Here's the amount. It's in your bank. Go check your bank or it'll be there in a couple of days. Right. And so you've just paid your bill in the click of a button. It is literally that easy. And by the way, when you use this system, your accounts payable, we will clear, we will know where the money went. So we will clear your accounts payable automatically. Whereas if you're using e-transfers, we're gonna have to ask you where that e-transfer went because it's not directly linked to a particular transaction in your accounting system. So now your AP is staying up to date in real time. Make sense? Absolutely. Now, what do we do about inventory? Again, because Visualize and Optisys do not integrate. Um, again, we're basically um, posting all I recommend purchases to a clearing account uh, throughout the month. And then at the end of the month, we'll get an inventory report from you. You go count your inventory however often you want to. We recommend once a month. If you've got one of the scanners, it gets pretty quick. 
um, and basically spit out an inventory report, load it into your financial hub, and we post the reconciling entries and your inventory is always up to date. Um, so, you know, that's that's still a manual, the, the counting of inventory is still a bit of a manual process on the back end. But as soon as one of these programs starts in, in, integrating with QBO, um, a lot of that time will be saved. What about payroll? Well, payroll's pretty, payroll gets pretty fun. We've got, um, we, we could, for example, install um, an iPad at the location or use one of the company's computers or use the staff's phones to put payroll, uh, sorry, to put timesheet software in. So boom, they clock in when they get to work. Now we've got a timesheet at the end of the pay period. We pull that in, through an integration into uh, one of the payroll providers that, that we support. Um, and you, you go ahead and approve the hours and you process the payroll at the click of a button. The, the payroll provider withdraws money from your company's account, the appropriate amount of money from your company's account. It drops the money into the employee's uh, bank account automatically. It emails and text messages them a pay stub. It sends money to CRA next month by the 15th so that the withholdings are sorted out and it goes and posts an entry in your accounting software that we need usually, you know, sometimes we need to go and double check those entries and make sure that they're right. Uh, but that's basically how we would set up a payroll system. Um, so it is, you know, the, the amount of time that's required there drops dramatically. You can even do scheduling through a tool like T-Sheets um, or Seven Shifts. I recommend T-Sheets over Seven Shifts in this in this application. So you never have to be wor worry about being, um, you never had to be worried about being late with uh, payroll remittances. And by the way, come year end, you know, February 28th or, or sooner than that, we're popping in, we do a quick T4 reconciliation and, and boom, T4s go out to all your staff, you know, automated. It's year end, <laughs> yeah, I mean, payroll is one of the biggest pain points for a lot of our clients. And certainly, I mean, we've got a, a direct experience with an optometrist that we work with where one of the main reasons that she came to us was because she was tired of using the online payroll calculator. I think her accountant was using the online payroll calculator. And it's like, this is not this is not an expensive thing to set up and get going on a very robust professional payroll solution that does all your calculations for you. If you're on with a third party benefits platform provider where they're you know taking medical off, you can have that auto deduct through this system and it and it does it all on the back end. You just need we need we set it up for you at the beginning and then it's basically on autopilot. You know, come your end time, we've already got all your information. And so we're basically after your end calling you and saying your your end is done as opposed to hi, I've got this giant request list for you. Um, and then when you're coming in to go over your year end with us, we've kind of been going over it with you all year. So there's no surprises and you can, um, you know, it's basically come in for a signature. So a lot of benefits to that. And so if you look at what, what good does all this do me and in context of a sale and what do buyers want, imagine handing your buyer a board level professional report about the operations of your business. Imagine saying, uh, I got a bit of a cutoff, that's non-prescription 2%, but imagine saying, here's a breakdown of my percentage of revenues, and this is up to date to 15 days ago, like we closed off last month end. Um, here's my cost of sales as a percentage. Um, here's my wages as a percentage of revenues month by month, right? And if you see a blip in that, I mean, you can see some consistency here, which you should be seeing, but if there was a blip in that, you would very easily be able to easily identify um, changes that need to be made in your operation. I mean, you could go down to daily wages as a percent of revenues if you wanted to get into that sort of granular level. Uh, purchases as a percent of prescription and non-prescription non sales. You know, anything you want to see, we can set up for you in an advanced reporting dashboard to really give you useful, actionable information about your business. But not only that, is when you, now when you're going to the, you know, somebody who's coming to sell their business to a buyer with one of these reports in hand and explaining the value of their business is going to go a lot farther than somebody who doesn't have it, right? This is the information about your business that the deep dive that you can do, right? Yeah, Another absolutely. example, here's where my cash flow went, right? I brought in 1.2 million and here's where the money went, right? So all kinds of great reporting we can do when we have access to real time, good usable information. Right. So what can we automate? I mean, it's it's endless um, the ways that we can 
help automate process and bookkeeping. So what can't be automated? Some source document submission cannot be automated, so you need processes for that. Invoicing and, and AR, we already talked about. Um, inventory management, it, it can be automated to a degree, but in terms of booking it into the accounting system, we need to do a manual entry at month end. Payroll approving and processing, we will never be responsible for money leaving your account. You will always have to have final say on that. Um, and what fails when we're setting up one of these systems? Well, uh, do I have this video here? Dang. I, I forgot to link this video back in. My apologies. This is a hilarious video from my childhood in Wayne's World where the hand just starts moving on the table and, and the, the punchline is we fear change because he just smashes the crap out of this hand for like 20 minutes. It's a great movie. If you haven't watched it recently, I recommend it. It's a great uh, quarantine video, high quality programming. <laughs> Failure points in cloud accounting. <laughs> Were you a big fan of Wayne's World? Uh, when you just say about uh, what people are watching now, the fact that yeah. Tiger King was trending. There you and go. And the new one is, is called Too Hot to Handle. I've got kids that are 17 and 20, and I can tell you it's made for some interesting conversations but boy are, are we lacking some intelligent viewing well intelligent viewing i mean just take your kids back to wayne's world do them a favor tell them that this was uh the high quality programming you know uh, anyways it, it was Fail much better <laughs> yeah I, I think so it was pretty crafty creative stuff tiger tiger i haven't gotten into the tiger thing yet um, yeah that's okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Failure points in cloud accounting. What fails when we set up? Because we've, you know, we've learned. We've been at this for a while now. We've had some failures with our clients. We've had some excellent successes. What are the main failure points? Organizational buy-in is a massive failure point, probably the number one. If you've got a team and that you're going to transition your business processes and your systems, think franchise for sale. Think really clean bookkeeping um, systems and really good accounting controls. If your team isn't bought into it and they've got inputs that they need to contribute, there's gonna be a failure point there and you're gonna get resistance. Particularly if somebody's used to doing data entry in their day-to-day -day job, right? You're gonna get some resistance there because now they don't need to do that anymore. And the, and the answer really becomes, great, you don't need to do that anymore. Now, how can we redeploy you on revenue producing activities and to making our clients happy as opposed to entering debits and credits, which computers can do now. And so it isn't about replacing people, it's about repurposing people to higher value tasks. Process and diligence, we will install or help you understand your business and install great accounting controls. We need diligence on that, meaning they have to be followed. And when they're not followed, things start falling sure. apart pretty quickly. I mean, I think that's within any organization. Understanding the inputs. Um, so when you set up an accounting system, it really is about what, what needs to be contributed to this accounting system and when. When an invoice comes through from direct energy, is that coming by email? Great, we can just set up a forwarding rule so that you never have to worry about that. But when you go out for lunch, sorry, you're gonna have to snap a picture and throw the receipt out, right? It's understanding where the inputs for your accounting system come from. Um, and then training, right? So, you know, often when we talk about installing software in an organization, no problem, we can install some software, but what's missed is the culture piece that goes along with the tr a transformation of this type of uh, program. And, and it's really getting your team to come on board, understanding the culture behind the change and how to have your people come along with the change. That needs to be managed. You know, flipping software is not uh, easy unless it's managed properly from a culture perspective. Regular review and feedback. We've had clients who thought everything was going great all year and they're giving their bookkeepers great feedback because their bookkeepers talking to them, but they have never looked at their books. Get to year end, the books are wrong. Well, I'm sorry, but that's a bit on you because you haven't been paying attention to it through the, throughout the year. The quality still relies on you inserting yourself in and understanding what's being produced for you. Um, transition planning, I think that goes back to culture and just flat out incompetence. We got some people who really resist this stuff, particularly within organizations, um, or they don't want to learn, and those people are not a good fit for this type of system. You know, they, they got to stick to the ledger paper and doing it the old way. I think, so I think you bring up a good point there, though. People What's are that? very resistant to change. And if we're talking about starting to prepare your business to sell, there's nothing, there's no bigger change than changing that leadership team of your business. 
So, yeah. so you do want to have a have a team that's ready to embrace change, and and unfortunately, sometimes not every team member is going to be a hugely valuable asset moving forward. And and I think using this period, like I hope you've been in communication with your team. I hope everybody is working together, but it's very easy to identify who your potential queen bees are or you know the, the people who aren't playing playing for the team and yeah. uh well and when you you know if you look at our website our third level of of service is we'll insult we'll insert a culture coach with you uh for for culture and leadership process mapping the whole shebang and what we have found internally i haven't had to fire anybody in a long time we've had a few people leave and when your culture is defined and your, your mission, your vision and your core values are defined in your business and you've got good accounting controls and business processes that create transparency within your organization, you'll find that people start self-selecting out because they can't, it's harder to get away with things that they disagree with. And so, you know, terminating, terminating people actually becomes pretty easy. They usually leave on their own, right? So, you know, that's, not having to do with this conversation really, but that's a whole other course. But, um, you know, it, it re you really need to address the cultural piece when you're dealing with with software implementation. So, you know, perspective, in my view, is everything. So, so I just want to insert a bit of a plug. Um, I, I am hosting uh, Pete Barron on our on our community team. Nice. We're going to do a webinar together on May the 13th. So okay. looking really forward to that and that that one's going to deal with crisis leadership, but really talking about about that culture. So we're going to get that covered coming up in the next month. So super excited about that one, too. Pete is an absolute champion. And if any of you have the opportunity to sit in and listen to that, uh, listen to him speak about that kind of stuff, you, you'll come away better than than you went in for sure. He's he's just an awesome resource for that. So and and he's one of our resources for that. Thank you. Uh, perspective is everything. So what are you doing here if you're looking at this stuff? You know, are you building a cloud based accounting system and inserting good accounting controls in order to absolve yourself of responsibility for your practices, bookkeeping and to rid yourself of unnecessary and burdensome tasks? Maybe, you know, maybe you want some more time at home with the kids and everything's going well and you just want somebody to take care of your bookkeeping, you know, or are you upgrading your practice to a great accounting system with sound controls? And, you know, this is a way to upgrade the performance and operations of your business. You're not just doing this to save time, but to have a more resilient business that will fetch a higher sale price. I think that that's a pretty good reason to look at upgrading your systems, particularly right now when you might have a bit more time to do so. Yeah, so, I think it's important, um, right? Because we've talked before, optometrists aren't necessarily trained business people. And yeah. we, we have an opportunity right now to you know, upgrade your business practices. But I also think for some optometrists, this time period where really for the most part, you are not seeing patients, you are needing to be a business owner. And that has scared, scared some of my colleagues for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's the tills no longer ringing like it once did. And so now what? And we've, we've experienced this in a big way in Alberta in a variety of industries, you know, my, I, I don't have a grandfather that was in the construction business, but let's just say my grandpa owned a construction business back in the in the 90s in Calgary. The till was ringing so fast, you know, and in the in the 2000s, the till was ringing so fast that um, it didn't really matter what you did; it was going to rain. And yeah. so that's not the reality we live in anymore. So you need to tighten up and figure out how to do business better. Really, um, you know, and successful practice owners are the ones who want to achieve scale and want to have a successful uh, practice. In, they focus on improved productivity. Uh, they understand and draw conclusions from their practices, financial data, become more efficient. I guess that's more to do with improved productivity. They focus their time on revenue producing activities and their customers and not on administrative tasks. They get obstacles and repetitive degrading tasks out of the way of their humans. Um, you know, I call them their humans because really data entry can be done by robots now. So automation process, automation process, repeat. 
And so, you know, just leave you with a crazy idea, you know, treat your business like a business rather than a job. You know, it's supposed to give you more freedom, uh, but maybe it isn't. When you start viewing your business from the eyes of a business leader, hungry for understanding and fixated on goals and measurement, what does that business look like? What would you have to do uh, for someone to, or what would you have to change for someone to want to buy your business? Would you have to change, uh, what would you have to change in order to franchise it? Um, you know, what if, what if you don't know? You know, where do you get the help? So, you know, would your business fizzle out and die without you or does it sustain itself? Can you go on holidays, right, without the walls crashing in? If we treat our businesses like growing, living, breathing things that provide value to our customers, um, in your case, our patients, and, we prov and, and provides for us and the people we love and the people that work with us, we might consider doing businesses a little bit differently. So get help. It, it's available. It's out there. And the help that has been that is available right now to private company owners with little businesses is at it's almost, I would say, at par with what you're going to hire in if you had the resources to do so to hire an internal finance department. You've got that available to you now where a few years back technology hadn't arrived such that you could. So, you know, that's my crazy idea. Um, you know, the, the, the resources are available. So take it over for a few questions. What are the best questions? Sorry, Roxanne, I should give you a chance. Do you want to throw anything in there? Yeah. Um, my screen has changed. Sure, here. I got I it coming to you right now. <laughs> yeah, here we go. It's up on the, the your screen's up. Okay. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so just to kind of reiterate on your crazy idea, right? How how can we help? So we're here presenting today and and actually giving education is a huge part of of what we do in our our daily practices with our clients. And right now, you and your team can certainly help help by assisting reviewing accounting and related automation needs inside practices as well as ensuring that people are structured properly. Um, to make sure that their passive assets don't make them ineligible for that lifetime capital gains exemption. Bingo. Yeah. And remember, that's 24 months you need to think about that for before sale. And I love apparently. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So in my case, what I'm doing is, is I'm helping you create that plan for your transition but also managing like the pacing of your, your corporate inactive income over time. So let's do some projections. Let's make sure we're gonna stay on side. Let's make sure we can maximize that small business deduction. So working together, and this is where I, I put on my tax hat again, is are you being tax efficient between your personal and your business, right? When you and or your family are the sole shareholders of your business, let's put together some tax efficiencies and, and make sure we're, we're doing that properly. And then, you know, together we've put together a, a really good group of, um, I'll say colleagues slash partners. Again, not not in that legal term, but but we can we can work together to make sure that that things are all integrating properly, right? Are those insurance policies integrating properly? Are we working with your accountant and your lawyer properly, right? Everything from that unanimous shareholders agreement that we've already talked about. I mean, um, does your does your accountant talk to your lawyer? We certainly do for our clients. I mean, that is really important stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when we work together as a team, we do accomplish so, so much more. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, positioning the proceeds of that sale. Ultimately, if your goal is to sell your business and create a retirement income, what does that look like? How are you going to make sure that your dreams do become a reality? Fabulous. So yeah, so just a little bit on, on question period. Um, just a note that my next webinar is Tuesday, May the 5th. Always a mountain time because we are situated here in Alberta. So 10 a.m. mountain time. That one is um, turning lemons into lemonade with Dr. Heather Cowie. So super excited to sit down with her and really talk about some strategies um, to help prepare for, for recovery using this, this current downtime wisely aside from our accounting, um, what else can we be doing? And then I did mention that on May 13th, we're gonna sit down with business consultant um, 
Pete, Pete Barron for a super exciting session on, on leadership. So, so yes, everything is talking a little bit COVID-19 in the background, but there's so much we can do with this opportunity if we want to look at it optimistically. Optometrically. Ah, there you go. Ah, okay, here we go. So let's do some questions. I did not receive a link to join the webinar. Will it be recorded? Okay, I don't think we got to do that one. Uh, <laughs> sorry, AJ, if you managed to get on. Um, what percent of normal revenues would you be bringing in to make the CEWS make sense? Um, I mean, the CEWS, if you're eligible, the CWS makes sense. It's a reimbursement of wages. Um, and so, you know, I guess the question becomes if your staff were earning less than 547 or sorry, $847 per week in sort of, or if they were earning less than $500 per week in baseline remuneration, um, which is a term you know, under the CEWS, it might be, they might be more financially benefited to go on the CERB and and not work uh, for you during or work I guess ten hours a week or sorry a thousand dollars a month worth is the is the threshold now it's changed and we haven't seen the new law to do with it yet I haven't checked this week because I've been buried but um, so it really depends on on a staff by staff basis if somebody's used to earning less than five hundred dollars a week maybe the CEWS doesn't make sense for them I think in all other cases it really does um, and so. In order to be eligible for the CWS, you need to have had a 15% drop in revenues in March um, or a 30% drop in revenues for April, May. And that is either compared to the same month last year, or you can take an average of January or February um, revenues. And the term revenues actually has some flexibility in it as well. You can do cash basis. Um, there's there, there's some wording in the legislation that lets you be a bit flexible with how, with what method you choose to to calculate your revenues for the whole thing including the comparative period and you can't change it throughout so i don't know if that answers your question it's almost always worth it if you're eligible um but, but tina asks what are the best questions to ask when interviewing an accountant slash bookkeeper How, oh and guys and gals remember uh clayton at akenhenderson.ca um i would have sent you a few emails leading up to this already so just reply to that if you want to ask a question so tina what are the best questions to ask when interviewing an accountant slash bookkeeper, how do I know I've selected someone who knows what they're doing uh, in my best interest? Can I answer that one? I was going to ask you to actually. <laughs> um, really, I like I said, I I underwent a number of different accountants over my practice career, and I truly wish you know Clayton and his team had been older so that they would have been there to help me out back then because i can tell you i had never found anybody as good as you what well, questions thank you. To I, ask? I wish there that. was a I, I wish there was a playbook on what questions to ask right unfortunately you often don't know till you're in it and when your business is running at full speed with patients it's pretty hard for you to carve out the time to to make those decisions and make changes there is no doubt so take this opportunity clayton does offer services across the country probably like myself with the exception of quebec correct um yeah we'll even uh, we'll even get into quebec it's just the qst is hard for us to manage yeah there's so yeah. many different rules in quebec <laughs> yeah but i mean uh, i guess what questions tina i think you really need to understand what you want from your accounting accountant right because we can do a lot of things for you an accountant is a pretty general broad term if you want to restructure your business to include your spouse in the ownership of your company you're going to need somebody who really knows tax if you just want somebody to bang out a cheap and easy um, compliance tax return at the end of the year and you're not really fussed about what condition it's in um in terms of the bookkeeping information that you're feeding to them maybe you just want that so are they good at doing year ends do you want somebody to manage your bookkeeping for you now you need a cloud accountant a uh, cloud bookkeeper preferably a cloud bookkeeper so they can manage it remotely and make sure that your books are updated kind of all the time which is what we do um and and so you know i guess if you want to operate on that level are they techie do they understand the new software tools that are available do they understand the integrations within the uh, optometry industry um that kind of stuff right if you've got a toe north and south of the border or you maybe are a u.s citizen does that accountant have u.s tax experience so i guess the questions to ask your accountant really depend on what 
you want. I think by and large, most accountants are going to be acting in your best interest, but it comes down to scope. You know, if you think that they should be doing something that they're not doing, you know, maybe the understanding isn't that they're supposed to be doing those things. So you really need to understand what you want from your accountant. Sorry, I've had you up on the screen the whole time there, Roxanne. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, oh, do you have anything to add to that or well, next question? I think sometimes when you're living in that fire, you don't always know what you want. Yeah. Right. So it can be tough to make those decisions. But again, you know, having a conversation with with your financial advisor, right? We can talk through some of those things and 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 figure out like what should you be getting from your from your accountant. Yeah. Well, and, and, and again, if you jump on the phone with an accountant like me um, and it freaks a lot of people out when we start talking, people will call me and within the first 10 minutes of the, of the phone call, I've asked them some really deep questions about their business because I want an understanding of what they're about and what their business is about. And immediately I want to give some gratification and, and some, you know, a few, a few quick answers maybe as to how they might be handling things or um, some praise about how they built their business. How much does your accountant ask you about your business? I think, I, I think that's really important. Um, and you'll usually know by talking to them, uh, talk to a few and you'll know by talking to them who's, who's most concerned with your business. Yeah, okay. I've also found with some of the bigger, the bigger, um, I'll, I'll call them multi-provincial companies, um, they're not always doing everything in-house, right? Do you have a relationship with your accountant? Yeah, 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 exactly. So what has been your experience? This is a good, I love tech, tech questions. Thank you so much. Um, this one's from Bruce. Bruce, what is your experience? What is the experience of transitioning from QB professional desktop to QB online? I've been with QB desktop since 98. Is the transition of data seamless, um, easy for my bookkeeper to learn? Um, so it depends on your bookkeeper. Um, if we were your bookkeeper, we would make the transition seamless. We do it all the time. Um, so I guess it really depends on the capabilities of your bookkeeper. A lot of a lot of bookkeepers, uh, particularly if, I don't want to say old school, but a lot of bookkeepers are really stuck on desktop software. Um, I'm not a bookkeeper. Um, I'm, I'm really, my concern is making sure that business owners have the information that they need right now all the time. And so from that perspective, the cloud is better, period. Um, and so um, it really depends on your bookkeeper. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, Bruce, I think that, you might find that QB, we certainly have um, a relationship, a big enough relationship with QuickBooks that when when we're doing transitions, they do most of it for us. QuickBooks will do most of it for us. So I'm not sure if that's available to you as well or not. Um, the second part of that question is Visualize has a QuickBooks export report. Do you know if it works properly with QuickBooks Online? I've not yet used it myself. Might be worth looking into. Um, Visualize does not have a QBO export. It does have a QBD export. My experience is, um, you know, generally speaking, on the purely sales related information within Visualize gives you everything you need to know about your sales. You don't need that data directly copied into your QuickBooks file for most reasons. When we're doing advanced level reporting, we can use Visualize as a data source to pull in and mix the data sets together to give you the type of reporting that you need. Um, and so I guess quick answer to no, Visualize does not export to QuickBooks Online. Yes, they do export to QuickBooks Desktop, but really the more the bigger question is, what are you using that for? What is the data that you're hoping to get from that integration? And I think most of the time what we found is um, using QBO and having us just do a, a monthly quick entry out of Visualize is equally as effective. Um, and by the way, I have talked to Visualize about the integration. Um, hopefully, hopefully something comes on that in the QBO space. Okay, Craig, I have a verbal agreement to sell my practice this year, but now COVID-19 and not knowing that the practices of optometry look like after we come out of this, does it impact the value of the practice? Craig, this is a totally psychological conversation here. Um, my, my view, I, I like to view problems as opportunities and the opportunity here is you've got a lot of patients who have not had their eyes checked for longer than they would have liked to and haven't bought glasses for longer than they would have liked to. And so I think with the correct marketing efforts and the right vision and the right cultural elements, um, optometry practices are 
if as long as they have the capital to ride through whatever forced closure the government is going to impose on us, um, which COVID-19 is going to impose on us, um, as long as you can ride that out, you're in a real nice position to come out of this clean. You are an, uh, an essential service and people need what you do. People need to see. So your business isn't going away unless you don't have the capital to ride this through, in which case, you know, that's a different story. Uh, take advantage of the government programs as much as you can. But I think that there's a huge opportunity here so that when when the thing unlocks, there's a big opportunity to come out of this clean and you're going to have a spike in sales and you can be able, you should be able to show that you've retained your clients, that they've come back in droves, that they've been dying to see you and that should look really good to a buyer. Yeah, yeah. make sure you're, you're in a position to retain those clients. Um, I have heard of some offices that completely closed and put a message on their website, a message on their phone, and they're not being accessible. I think it's super important that you continue to be accessible to your patients. Make sure they know you're still there. Right? That's a really great point, Roxanne. I have never talked to so many people in such a short period of time as I have in the last five weeks. Right, and we're in this. We're we're in the same business. You you guys are more essential than than I am, but we're both essential services. And so, you know, there's an opportunity here to get people get talking to people and make sure they know about you. That's such an awesome point, Roxanne. Uh, that's it for questions. I don't see any others coming through, so I guess we will wrap it up there. Um, Roxanne, how do people get a hold of you? Yeah, so the easiest way to get a hold of me is my first name, Roxanne. I've got actually two email addresses. It's kind of crazy, but Roxanne at Clarity Financial dot services. And the other one is Roxanne at CFSPSC dot CA. Or, um, or you can get a hold of me um, by my website, Clarity Financial Services, or by phone. Right on. I'm Clayton, Clayton at AikenHenderson.ca. You would have seen that email come through 403-271-3106 or our website is AikenHenderson.ca. I will send a follow-up email out with the recording and, uh, and so you can watch it again and that email will have our contact information as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Roxanne, for putting this together and allowing us yeah. to host. Thank you. Thanks for allowing us to tap into your tech. Um, I. You are definitely more tech savvy than I am, so I, I do appreciate your assistance in that side for sure. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.